Leila McCalla is a singer and classically trained cellist. She's of Haitian descent, born and raised in New York, and now based in New Orleans. Her music mixes all those elements together. Leila's debut solo album is a tribute to the African-American poet and activist Langston Hughes, putting his poetry to music. On the album, she plays cello, banjo, and guitar, and sings in English, French, and Creole. She's also included some Haitian folk songs and original pieces of her own, the album is called Very Colored Songs, and Layla McCalla joins me in the studio. Layla, welcome. Thank you. So describe your music for us first. Um, I think my music comes from a, a number of places. Uh, I am a cellist, but I also play guitar, and I also play tenor banjo. I listen to a lot of different kinds of folk music, and I think that is, you know, audible in my songs and my family is from Haiti and so that's been a, a big source of creative inspiration as well. Okay so you're gonna um, show us a little bit of these non-classical techniques you use on the cello. Okay. So describe it while you're cool. showing us. Cool. Um, I taught myself to play guitar when I was 13 and I think a lot of my uh, different techniques I use on the cello really come from my guitar playing. Uh, the song Heart of Gold that I'm about to play uh, I do a lot of strumming, and it's kind of like if I was playing a guitar but turned it upright and it was a cello. <laughs> um, and so I usually uh, pluck a bass string and then run my index finger on my right hand across the strings. I'm not used to explaining this. <laughs> I just do it normally. Um, it's not easily explained. Yeah. Uh, there's another song on the album called La Tibonite that I... Kind of strum like that. Uh, there's another song that I'm finger picking. And there's another song where I'm kind of slapping the strings and plucking them with my right hand and my left hand. So uh, uh, the album definitely uses a lot of these different techniques that I normally don't think of. <laughs> I just do them. But uh, Where did yeah. these techniques come from? Because I know you didn't learn them in, uh, in classically uh, trained uh, cello school. No. Um, when I was about 17, my aunt took me to a party. She's a, she's a singer and songwriter and plays guitar, and she took me to a party in Brooklyn. And there was a Haitian um, roots music band playing, and they had a cellist playing. And this cellist just blew me away. Um, his name is Rufus Cappadocia, and I, uh, I formed a friendship with him, and, and he's kind of a mentor and close friend of mine, but I started taking lessons with him outside of school. And, um, you know, just to see a cellist play in that context really blew my mind, and it it really changed my life because it made me realize that there was more that I wanted to do with music than just being part of the classical, you know, construct. Okay, so tell us what you're going to sing and, uh, and go ahead and do it. This song is called Heart of Gold, and it comes actually from a poem by Langston Hughes called Very Colored Song, uh, which is how I got the name for my album, Very Colored Songs. Some folks I know I'd up and sell My heart of gold And head north with the dough But I don't have a heart of gold My heart's not even lead 
It's made of plain old Georgia clay And that's why my heart is red I wonder why red clay so red in Georgia sky so blue I wonder why it's yes to me but yes sir sir to you I wonder why the sky so blue and why the clay so red why down south is always down and never up instead Layla McCalla, she's a singer, songwriter, classically trained cellist. Her album is Very Colored Songs, a tribute to Langston Hughes. Let's talk about Langston Hughes. Sure. <laughs> Why do you think his, poet, his poems resonate so much with you? There are just so many levels of why they resonate with me. I think they resonate with a lot of people. Um, he has a way of speaking about very complex issues in a very simple kind of presentation. Um, I think that his, his words are very powerful and easy to understand, but that I think that a lot of the things that he ta- is speaking about in his poetry are very complex um, in our culture, uh, particularly sort of the way that he is able to frame the, the black, black culture and black experience in the United States. And, um, and also, you know, some of his, a lot of his work is also just very human. You know, there's a very human element in his poetry um, and in the stories that he tells and kind of creates. And, um, and I think that it's just, uh, it, it's the kind of thing that just goes straight, you know, straight to your chest. Um, and I, I felt that way about his music, I mean, <laughs> about his poetry, and, and that inspired me to create the music, <laughs> you know. <laughs> How would you say the path that he took resembles or mirrors your own? I guess the path that he took uh, was not very conventional. Um, he had a very complicated relationship with his father, and he, you know, was financially supportive to his mother um, for the very beginning of his career, I'm not saying that I I have those issues, um, but I think that there were a lot of things that could have deterred him from pursuing a creative path with his life, but he kind of stuck to his guns and just kept on creating work. And, um, you know, I think that my, my sort of path has been pretty unconventional as well. Um, I've, I've gotten a lot of encouragement and support from my family, but I really have in many ways had to carve out my path because the answers weren't always very clear about, um, you know, I, I studied classical music for so long and, and then knew at a certain point that that wasn't going to work, you know, for me in, uh, in the big picture of my life. And, um, you know, I think that to, to, you know, it's one thing for your family to be supportive when they, when it makes sense that you're on this path that they can see and that they can relate to other things. But when you're on a different path and they have to trust you, it's it's there's no obvious career path. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just been like you know, I've been working on this project for so long, and I think that it, it was hard for anyone to understand what it was, including myself. You know, um, but I think maybe that's just what. Being a creative person is like you get these 
urges that you can't resist, you know, creative urges that you can't resist. And you have to kind of, uh, you have to stick to your guns. And I think that that's really hard to do in the face of having to survive as an artist and, you know, pay school loans and rent and, you know, all the, all the pressures of our, our world. So why were you attracted to the cello in the first place? It's actually a funny story. I got stuck playing the cello when I was in the fourth grade. Um, I guess in third grade, we, we got to choose three different instruments that we would take up the following year. And um, I chose, I had been playing piano from first grade. And, um, and I, my, I just chose cello. And my parents didn't, you know, they didn't contradict me on that choice because they thought, wow, that's amazing. Our daughter wants to play cello. But they didn't know that I didn't know what a cello was. And so when I went to, you know, go pick out my instruments, I thought cello was like a piccolo. And um, I remember the, the, this woman, the Miss, Mrs. Marcus, screaming across the room, Layla McCalla, and she had a cello in her hand. I turned around, and I looked at the cello, and, and she handed me the cello, and she said, you have long legs, you're going to be good at the cello. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, um, you know, it took, a, it took a while before I could actually make a sound that sounded half decent on the, on the instrument, and uh, a couple of years of private lessons and, and actually caring about, about the cello. But uh, it's something that I fell in love with, I think, probably when I was in middle school. And, um, and I just, it, it really took over my life, you know. I, 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 dis- I, I decided from a very young age that I wanted to be a musician and that I want, wanted that to happen. So you were going to really pursue this professionally you were going to learn all the classic pieces mm-hmm. and you imagined yourself in like chamber orchestras yeah, on yeah. these nice stages and these yeah. nice venues. And yeah, actually, I, I mean, I guess that's what I imagined. I, I, but I did really love chamber music. And so I always wanted to be in a string quartet or a string trio or something like that. So why did you leave New York to go to New Orleans? Um, well, I left New York at a time in my life when I had I had been out of college for three years, and I was just tired of New York. I was freelancing with a lot of different projects. I was teaching. I was bartending. I was here. I was there. Um, and I felt kind of pulled in so many different directions, and I felt like New Orleans was going to be a place where I could focus and um, which is which is hilarious that I thought that because it's like party central USA, you know. Um, but there is a lot of creative energy in the city, and and it just gives you a little bit more breathing room. And I guess I I do pretty well focusing on my own when I decide I want to do something. Um, and so New Orleans was just a good fit for me, and it's been. Um, you know, I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I really think that my move to New Orleans made this album possible and has made a lot of different things uh, over the past few years of my life possible. Layla McCalla is a singer-songwriter. The album is Very Colored Songs, a tribute to Langston Hughes. So when you get to New Orleans, you set up your cello and you sit on a milk crate <laughs> on the street <laughs> playing Bach. Right. Was that your plan to make a living in New Orleans? Yes, that was my plan. With um, your little cello case open for coins? Yeah. I had been visiting New Orleans uh, and paying for my trips by playing in the street. And so I kind of got a feel for what that was like. And just kind of through my, you know, I didn't see any other cello players playing classical music on the street or any cello players in general playing on the street, it's a lot of, uh, you know, traditional New Orleans jazz bands or like you know, amplified electric blues guitar. And um, there was one guy who used to drive me crazy. He used to play uh, Take Me Out to the Ball Game and had this like, had this uh, kick drum strapped to his back. And, you know, it's just all kinds of different shtick <laughs> happening on the street. Um, and my, I guess my shtick even though, you know, I, I didn't really feel that way about it. But um, it was more just like, I know I can do this. I can play Bach. And it's different than what other people are doing. So I used to set up on the corner of Royal Street and Conti. Royal Street is a street in New Orleans that has a lot of uh, antique stores and art galleries. And um, it's kind of, they, sh- they shut down the street for part of the day. So people set up and, and busk. And... Um, and so I, uh, you know, I did that for a while, and I just 
you know, I developed relationships with some of the business owners who were supportive and but were you, know, you able to support yourself doing that? Yeah, yeah. That's all I did. That's all I did. To make a living. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I did that and I was teaching, but my, 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 the bulk of my money came from the street. So how do you make a transition from Bach and classical music to what you're doing now? I think that I had, I, it wasn't like I did that and then I did this. I think all of those things were kind of happening at the same time. Um, like I said, when I, when I met Rufus, I really started to develop Um, a sense of playing without needing to see music um, in front of me. And when I moved to New Orleans, I really started to learn a lot more about Cajun music and old-time music and traditional New Orleans jazz. And it was around that time that I also... um, went on tour with the Carolina Chocolate Drops. and so I wanted to ask you about them. Who are they and how did you get involved with them? Um, the Carolina Chocolate Drops were a band that formed in 2005. Or, I mean, they, they still exist. They still are a band. Um, but the band originally formed in 2005, and they met at something called the Black Banjo Gathering in, um, I believe, Mebane, North Carolina. And um, it was a gathering of people who were kind of interested in discussing the African and and black roots of the banjo. And so the band formed out of this sort of experience of conversation, sort of intellectual conversation and playing some music. And um, and it's a big mission of the band to spread sort of the... um, to, to dispel the myth that folk music is is exclusively white music. Um, and, and string band music in particularly, um, th- that that is not exclusively white music. And so um, I came onto the band after a few incarnations of the band already. Um, and I toured with them for about two and a half years. And I actually met them from playing on the street. You and, got uh, discovered on the street, didn't you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I. It's funny, you know. You always think like, would it have happened if this or if that? You know, who knows? But um, but. So why did you decide to go solo then, a solo album? Well, I think that I had always had the idea to create this album. Um, like around the time that I moved to New Orleans, I thought, I want to make something. You know, I didn't know exactly what that something was. Um, but I think that being with the Chocolate Drops gave me an opportunity to learn about sort of the reality of touring and making albums and having a label and having management and an agent and and to kind of feel out whether that was really going to be right for me. And I think through the band, I I decided to go for that path, at least for now in my life. Who knows what's going to happen in the next few years? Um, and and I felt like, you know, this album needed to be heard. And so I just kind of, I had a choice, you know. I could stay with the band or I could go on my own. And I always felt like, well, if I don't go on my own, then I'll never know what it was, you know, it, what would happen if I did that. Um, it's kind of like you're in the room with the two doors and, you know, one is like a little bit more safe and secure and one of them is more adventurous. And I guess... I usually go the adventurous path. (laughs) Layla McCalla is in the studio with me. She's a singer, songwriter, classically trained cellist. Her debut solo album is called Very Colored Songs, a tribute to Langston Hughes. You used Kickstarter to put this album together. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your experience with that. I had heard a lot of success stories with it, and um, I didn't really have a clear idea of how much money I would need to pull this off. So I asked for $5,000 because that felt like, okay, that's reasonable, that's doable, that's the absolute minimum, you know, if to just like press the CD and pay the musicians. And the recording studios and things like that. Yeah, and, and I quickly met my goal. And then Kickstarter, I guess, you know, sees how how fast things happen, you know, for their different projects. And the people at Kickstarter really liked the project and really liked my video. And so they shared it on their newsletter. And, um, you know, I went from sending out an update that was like, who's going to be my 200th backer 
to having over 550 backers in 48 hours from all over the world, you know, it's like people from New Zealand were, were saying, I love this project and, and supporting me. And um, it's really incredible to see the community at large sort of come, come and, and, and want to support something that they, you know, and had how never much heard did, of before. How know? much did you raise in the end? I think in the end it was $21,000, about $21,000. So, Layla, you've performed in France. Mm -hmm. How's your music um, received. received there in France? I've had a really warm reception in France. I think uh, because, you know, I'm I'm Haitian. People in France love New Orleans um, because there's so many. Uh, there's a, a history in New Orleans of you know. Louisiana was French at one point, you know. But I bet they don't like how uh, French is a little bit changed. <laughs> well, it's funny. I think that they... You know how they are about their, yeah, their language. Yeah, I think it, it just depends on the context, you know. I definitely... Uh, I'm learning more about French culture and and the things that are acceptable and the things that are unacceptable. And it, it's, a, it's a lot of gray area in there. <laughs> um, You're fluent in French. Not fluent, but okay. I speak. Yeah, and I've... Okay. I've gotten a lot better since traveling in France more. Um, you know, when I first got there, I was excited because I had been, you know, studying on my Rosetta Stone, my French, and then I got there and people were speaking so fast. <laughs> and now I kind of like can catch the words, you know, more quickly. Um, it's fun. You've been visiting Haiti um, a couple of times. Mm -hmm. How is that um, inspiring your music? Oh, it's, it's, I think it's been uh, a big part of why I have kind of delved deeper into Haitian music. My, I've been visiting Haiti throughout my entire life. Um, I lived there, you know, for a few months at a time when I was very, very little, and uh, spent a summer there when I was 10 years old. And then my mother moved to Haiti after the earthquake and uh, is working with a nonprofit in Port-au-Prince. And, and so I visit her almost every Christmas the past years, besides this past Christmas. Um, and... Uh, just to s so many things, uh, you you're you're when you go to Haiti, you are so. At least for me, I feel my senses are just bombarded. There's just so much happening, you know. I think at one point I I was saying uh, to my sister, oh, I think I'm starting to understand the traffic rules here. There's just no lanes. You just go, you know, and like it's wherever just you a can find a little. <laughs> yeah, there's just a different kind of system and a different way of life and I think that uh, Haitian culture and creativity is so complex and so interesting and it's it's something that I um, you know I strive to understand I don't feel like I'm like the expert on on Haiti by any means um, but I find it endlessly fascinating and and I think it's really cool that it's part of my heritage you said before that you really wanted this album to get out what are you trying to say with this album and these songs well, I think huh, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I think the more that I have sort of talked about the album and the further I get away from being inside the making of the album, um, I see kind of how I'm processing my experience and my identity through a lot of these songs. Um, you know, the, a lot of the things that have been perplexing to me about, you know, racial relationships in the United States. I think a lot of those are um, expressed in some of these poems and, and in some of the music that I wrote. And also um, just the, the stories of people's lives. I, I feel like we, we need to collectively remember um, that and... Uh, remember those stories and I feel like Legs and Hughes does such an uh, incredible job of of telling stories without saying this is a story you know um, and so I I guess that's the the point of the album is just rem ha remembering all these elements of human experience and black experience and American experience and um, Haitian experience I don't know there's I guess you could uh, project anything onto some of the songs you're going to do another song for us, this yep. time with your banjo. Mm -hmm. So set it up for us. Sure. 
This song is called Messi Bon Dieu, which means in uh, Creole and, and, Fran and French, uh, thank you, Lord. It's funny when I'm in France, people start cracking up if I say this song is called Messi Bon Dieu because it sounds like so religious, you know. Um, but the song is uh, it's a, an old Haitian song, and it's saying, uh, thank you for ending our misery. The corn is growing and the rain is falling. All the hungry children are eating. So let's dance. Our Father up in heaven says, our misery is over. Messi bon Dieu. Gare kuma la misa e fini pour nous. Merci bon Dieu, gare tout ça la nature pote pour nous. Merci bon Dieu, gare kuma la misa e fini pour nous. Merci bon Dieu, gare tout ça la nature pote pour nous. La pluie tombe, ma y poussé. Tout le monde qui gongo pour aller manger On nous danse Congo, on nous danse Petro Papa bon Dieu dit non c'est la mise à fini Papa bon Dieu dit non c'est la mise à fini pour nous Merci bon Dieu, gare kuma la misa e fini pour nous. Merci bon Dieu, gare tout ça la nature pote pour nous. Merci bon Dieu, gare tout ça la nature pote pour nous. Merci bon Dieu, gare kuma la misa e fini pour nous. La pluie tombe, ma y poussé. Tout le monde qui gongo pour aller manger On nous danse Congo, on nous danse Petro Papa bon Dieu dit non c'est la mise à fini Papa bon Dieu dit non c'est la mise à fini pour nous Mise nous fini, mise nous fini, mise nous fini Layla McCalla, singer songwriter, her album is Very Colored Songs, a tribute to Langston Hughes. Thanks so much for being on the program. Thank you.